Okay. Sorry. Hey, it's a, I was coming to. Um, Y'all, you know what time of year it is, right? No, because I know you're thinking, it's Final Four, it's this weekend, you're right, but that's not what I'm talking about. Maybe you're thinking, it's tax season, right? That's what he's talking about. Nope, I'm not talking about that either. You're thinking, huh, after Easter, springtime? Yeah, it's spring. Nope, not talking about that. I'm talking about something that's much more reliable than all those things. I'm talking about ants on the countertop. <laughs> Anybody else got ants on the countertop? Amen. 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 I don't know why, but they, they seem to just know that it's that time of year, right? It's and they only they only they never show up until the spray man comes, the bug guy comes, and they're out like the next day. It happens every year. He gives us these little baits to put around the countertop. You know, they're supposed to work. Oh, they don't do anything, I don't think. But he gives them to us anyway, and we put them out like we're supposed to because. You know, we're going to be good people and we're, that's what we're supposed to do, right? I've noticed though, I mean, so it forces us to clean the counter, right? But you can clean that counter as much, I mean, you can clean it down, you, know, you can strip it. You can get that rubbing alcohol and rub on that countertop and get it just as, I mean, as clean as it could be. And they still come out. I don't know what it is that draws them there, but there is something happen, there's something at work there that frankly I, I can't see. That's what, that's what we're talking about today. It's the rain. It's the rain. Yeah, well, <laughs> they came out before the rain started. Let me tell you. <laughs> they were there well before. But, but they're still there. There's nothing on the counter, and they're still there. All I want to say is that there's something bigger going on than what we can see on the counter, anyway. So today, we're, we're in our study of the, the book of Acts and working our way through it. Today, we're looking at two stories in one section uh, that are miracles, that are healings. And what I want to talk about today is the greater miracle, the miracle that's behind the miracle that, that we may not see right away, that we maybe need to spend a little time to, to really to spot it in our lives. Because Jesus, we, or many of us even here maybe, desire physical healing, right? We want to be made whole in some way, fashion, form, whatever. But, but the reality is what we need more is a spiritual healing. That's, that's what we really need. I mean, we want to get rid of this ache and pain, but what we need is a spiritual healing, and that's what we're going to look at in today's passage as we, we begin this kind of transition, as it were, from, from looking at Saul and his life and how he was such a bad guy that God turned him around, to now we're looking at Peter and how Peter carried the gospel and Jesus actually, him being alive, changed people's life. Changed people's life. If you're here today and you want something different, I just want to, I want to tell you that, that something different is available. Something very different. It may not be what you're looking for, but I promise you it's going to be better than what you're looking for. And it is right here in our midst. Two ministries, two uh, healings <coughs> right here in the same little passage. Peter has been given the keys to the kingdom. I don't know if you remember that story about him and Jesus. But he's, he's been, Peter is on a mission as part of his ministry to, to open the, the kingdom of God to the, the people from different groups from around the world. He's given them the privilege to, to, to enter into God's kingdom. Jesus had, had shown that the entrance to the kingdom isn't a birthright, actually. It's by being born again. It's, it's salvation that, that ushers us in to the kingdom of God. And in that, we experience individually our own little Pentecost. When you're saved, when you receive the Spirit of God, He comes to live inside of you. In that moment, you're, you're transformed. And so each one of us gets our own day of Pentecost from the moment you were saved. Peter is here to proclaim that. That's what he's talking about. That's actually what the whole book of Acts is all about. It's the story of the unstoppable power of the gospel. The unstoppable power of the gospel. Today, if you have your Bible, which you hope you brought it with you, or you're scrolling on your telephone, what have you, uh, we're in Acts chapter 9. We're going to start verse 32. Real briefly, it's only about four verses here we're going to jump into first. As Peter traveled up about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda, Lydda, however you want to say it. And there he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic, who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take your mat, take care of your mat. And immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. I mean, you think that this got some people's attention, right? This guy's been bedridden for eight years and now, boom. He's up walking around. He's probably doing a little more than walking. He's probably doing a little dancing. He's probably doing a little running around in the streets. He's probably making a scene. Everybody sees it, right? And he tells everybody. It's a very 
similar story you probably heard back in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus was teaching and some guys had a friend who was a paralytic and they couldn't get to Jesus. And so what did they do? Remember they tore the roof off the thing and they lowered him down. And Jesus is like, hey, what's going on here? And he says, he tells, as the man comes down, he says, your sins are forgiven you. Man, the Pharisees, they went, what? what? You can't forgive a man's sin? What are you doing? He said, well, which is easier, to heal him or to forgive his sins? And then before they could answer, he said, get up, you're healed. Take your mat and walk. And he did. Jesus said, I, you want to talk about something hard to do? So, so very similarly, Peter uses those same, he's probably drawn on that same experience that Jesus had. And he tells the same paralytic man, get up and take your mat and walk. Four lessons I think we can see in this short little story of this man that is insignificant otherwise, but I believe can have real significance for us. The first one is that miracles are divine appointments. We want to plan them. We want to, we don't want to happen on our timetable all the time, but really they're divine appointments. Now, Pete, now as Peter is traveling through all the regions, he came down to the saints in Lydda, and there he found a man named Aeneas. He was just, he was just doing his thing. He was, he was doing ministry, itinerant ministry, right? We're traveling around, but, but you, know, you don't think of the significance of that. But Jesus had told his disciples the significance of it, right? He said, come and follow me, but you're not going to know where you're going to lay your head. You're, you're not going to know where you're going to sleep at night. You're not going to know where your next meal's coming from, because we're going to trust the Spirit. We're going to follow God's Spirit. And wherever he leads us, we're going to follow him. When he tells us to stop, we'll stop. And when he tells us to eat there, we'll eat there. That's what we're going to do. And that's a radical dependence. But that's what Peter was used to now. That's what he was, that's how he was living his life. Each moment arranged by God. Each moment, every step, every place he would sleep was arranged by God. The church in Judea, where this man Anas was, was had, had begun to form after all these persecutions that happened, right? They didn't, if you don't remember, there were some Christians from Pentecost who saw the Holy Spirit fall, and they, they probably went back to Judea. And then there were some who who were there when, when Paul started you know, arresting Christians after, after Pentecost, and that, they're back in Judea now. And then there are others who probably had heard about Stephen or, or seen the ministry of Philip, and they'd gone back to Judea. So, so all of these influences had, had really gave them the church, given the church in Judea some stories to tell. They knew what Jesus was doing. They knew what these disciples were doing. And so when Peter showed up, and they weren't expecting him, Peter just shows up. But in both accounts that we're going to look at today, the Christians who were there, who were just doing life, they're referred to as saints. Saints. Now, before you, that's not the idea that there were some super duper Christians, right? They weren't some like fantastical Christians better than everybody else. No, no, no. Saints in the sense that they were just different than everybody else who lived there. They were markedly different. Their lives had been transformed by God. And they were living distinct, <clears throat> set apart lives. We just had a, a holiest month, day of the year for Christians. This past week, do you feel like you've lived a set apart life? Or were you like me, just kind of got caught up in the moment of day to day to day to day to day to day, day, day here to Sunday? How do we demonstrate to the world that we're saints? How can we show the world that we're actually different? They were going to talk about that. Lydda, you see, or Lydda, however you want to say it, was, was in Judea. It was largely a Gentile city. It was, it was only kind of a trade city. So the idea is, the expectation is, is that Aeneas was probably not a Christian. He was probably a Hellenistic Jew, but he wasn't, he probably wasn't one of the saints. That's why Peter described it that way. Is I went and met the saints, and I met a man named Aeneas, right? He's, he's separate. He's distinct from them. So, Peter, doing what Peter does, has this divine appointment that the Father has arranged with a man that he didn't really go to see, but was there, and he didn't shy away from spending time with him. Peter was available for whatever divine appointments that God had planned. Do you make time for people that God has put in your path? Or are you like me, like your pastor, unfortunately? If you're busy, you got something else pressing on your schedule that you need to go take care of. That you see the people in need, but you don't stop. Don't spend time with them. You just wrote, hey, how you doing? Chit chat and move on. That should be something that we need to see here in the story of 
Aeneas, but divine appointments are special. Yeah. Are special when you take advantage of them, when God gives them to us. Yeah. Secondly, we need to know that we all need to be healed. We see that in the story. He's described as a man who's been bedridden for eight years, paralyzed. A pitiful picture, right? I mean, he didn't have a wheelchair to get around on. He didn't even have a, you know, a TV with a you know, DVR and, and Netflix and, and all that to, to just scroll through while he was laying there in bed. Some things have passed his time. No, he didn't have any of that. What he had was misery. What he had was a reminder all day, every day of how little hope that he actually had. People like this should stir our hearts a little bit, right? It should fill us with some compassion. We should be like, oh man, I gotta help them somehow. Should, but unfortunately, what tends to happen for us is when we see people in great need like that, well, maybe I'm not talking about you as much as I'm talking about myself, is that oftentimes that I have to look away. I can look for a minute, but then I have to, I can't take it. Like that's just, it's overwhelming. And unfortunately, instead of stirring up in me compassion, what it stirs up in me is avoidance. Yet remember the compassion of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who didn't see people as a, as an interruption, even people with great need, but he saw them as part of what he was here for. As should we, right? As should his people. For eight years, this man has been impotent, essentially, unable to do what God had created him to do. So it's stuck in bed, paralyzed, can't move. He can't. He can't do the things that the human body is created to do. <coughs> and that can happen to us spiritually as well. In fact, it does happen. It probably has happened to most all of us in this room. And some of you maybe now dealing with spiritual paralysis. What am I talking about? I know things that you've been wanting to do. Things that you know you ought to do. Conversations that you ought to have. And you've been saying, I wish I would do that. Or I wish I want to do that. Or I should do that. Someday I'm going to do that. Some days I wish never seems to show up, right? I've been there. As a matter of fact, I've been there just recently. You're suffering from paralysis of the will because you're looking through your own resources. That you, you wish you could do that. And oftentimes you can't. You expect that somehow that you'll get this special feeling, this 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 buzz from the Spirit of God. He'll kind of he'll kind of vibrating and he'll like buzz you, and kind of like a, your alarm on your phone will go off, and you're like, oh, now I got it. Uh, Lord Jesus, we want to pray for these first responders who are going out right now. I ask you, God, just to go before them and be with those that are they're responding to. Bless them, keep them in your guard. We pray. For you. The fact is, as I was saying, while we, we, we want to, this prompting of the Spirit to get moving, to, to do that thing, what we really need is spiritual healing. That's why we haven't done it, is because we need, because we're broken people, we need the spiritual healing in that part of our life. We all need to be healed. Spiritual paralysis affects, it's unavoidable. It's part of what, what theologians have always called the depravity of man. The, the inability of us as human beings to consistently do the right thing without the Spirit of God at work in us. It takes the Spirit of God at work in me for me to really do the right thing consistently. That's why our greatest need is Jesus. We all need to be healed. We all have the same infection. And we all need the same healing. And that is Jesus. Matter of fact, there's only God that can heal. That's what we see from Aeneas. It's only God can, can heal. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. If you remember the passage from, from back in uh, Luke chapter 5 where Jesus healed a man that came through the roof, he told him, take your mat and go. Take your mat and go. Peter is not a faith healer. He's not, he's not one that his ministry, his whole ministry, was under the direct submission to the power of Jesus. It is Jesus here who is healing? It is Jesus who is doing this? I mean, Easter's long gone. Jesus' resurrection. He's not there personally, physically, but he is there. His power is there. He is the one doing the healing. When Jesus healed, and 
when he was present in the Gospels when Jesus healed, it was never the responsibility of the one being healed. It wasn't their faith that made them well. It wasn't their faith that restored them. It wasn't their faith. It wasn't about them. It was Jesus doing it. He had people come to him for healing that didn't believe him. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, I would say that it was very... I, I don't know of any of the disciples in the New Testament that you would ever find that were actually healed. It was always people who were outside of the faith, who were being brought into the faith through healing. It wasn't followers who came to him and said, hey, I, I got an illness, can you make me well? Well, that wasn't the case. It was always the outsiders. It was the healing that led to their conversion. God heals that he may be glorified, you see? God heals so that he can get the glory for it. Not so that we can be good enough to deserve it. Not that we can pray hard enough to get it. It's for him. It's him. His healing comes to give his messengers and his message credibility so we can trust his word. Because he's, it's him who does it all on his timing. And every time when he heals, he convicts people of sin. Because we're in awe of his power, of his ability. That's, that's what the healing is all about. Giving him glory. Giving his message credibility. And convincing the world of its need for a savior. Peter directed all of the focus, not on himself, not on Emmaus, but on Jesus. And what happened next? And they asked us, told, get up, take your stuff. And he did. <laughs> and he told the whole town. And the whole town believed because this guy had been out for eight years. Do you believe that Jesus has, still has the power to change, to heal today? Do you believe that? He does. He, he's actually doing it right now in our midst. He's actually changing people. Restoring relationships. He did it then, and he's still doing it. The fourth lesson we see here from Aeneas is that the truest of healing is really spiritual healing. That's the greatest form of healing that we can experience. All who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. The man was not healed just so that he could enjoy a healthier life. That's not why he was healed. His healing was for others to see the glory of God. And it created a, a, a movement of people who, who desired to serve the Lord. That was the point. They turned to the Lord, the scripture says. The, the whole town turned to the Lord. You can't genuinely believe. To, you, can't, you can't really turn to Jesus without turning from sin. You can't do both. When we put our faith in Jesus, we turn to him as the Lord of our life. It, it means that we turn away from me, from, from all the things that I, I fill my life with that aren't him. But then we become a follower, a disciple. You can't say, I want Jesus, but I, won't, I don't want to give up my sin. You can't say that. I mean, you can, but, but that's, not, that's not part of it. You have to walk away from all of them. Our community, your neighbors, whoever the people around you don't know Jesus. Our world is full of people who want to turn from their sin. They want to leave brokenness behind, but I'm not saying they want to turn to Jesus. I'm just saying that they, they want the dysfunction of their world, their life, healed. They just they don't know how that Jesus is the way to get the healing. They don't know the power to radically transform that this paralytic man found. It didn't let him to walk in and run in, hopping up and down, telling his neighbors what had happened. The power of Jesus was alive in him. And it's alive today. He's alive today. We said it at the beginning. But this is still Easter. This is another Easter Sunday. That's a lot for three verses. But let's move on to Joppa. I'll go quicker for the rest of them, I promise. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated as Dorcas, oh my goodness, sorry for her in middle school, right? Especially middle school today. Oh my goodness. Who was always doing good and helping the About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa, about 10 miles away. 
So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken to the upstairs room. All the windows, all, windows, all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa. Sorry. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Amen. Lord Jesus, we ask you again, be with those who are responding to this call. Bless them, Father. Keep them safe and those who are suffering and in need today. Amen. 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 So now we're changing our focus to the healing of Tabitha. Tabitha, uh, Dorcas, as, as she is. The same points that we made about Aeneas could be said about Dorcas. The same, the same truths about the healing of Aeneas could be said about the, the truths of the healing of Tabitha. The difference is, is that Tabitha was a disciple. So she already knew most of those realities of healing. Spiritual healing was necessary. She'd already experienced it. She was a follower. She was a disciple. We also find her story to be very similar to a healing that Jesus performed. Remember when Jesus uh, was, Jairus, the, the soldier, came and got Jesus and asked him to come and heal his daughter. And on Jesus' way, the woman touched him. And she'd been uh, sick for 12 years or whatever and, and it delayed Jesus. Delayed Jesus. Because now instead of healing the little girl, he had to raise her from the dead. You remember that? And what did he say to the little girl when he healed her? He said, Talitha Kume. Get up, little girl. That's what he said in the Aramaic. Get up, little girl. And here, Peter does the same. You know, Peter's having the same issue. He's taken up to upstairs to a woman who's dead. And what does he say to her? To Tabitha Kume. One letter different. From Talitha, a little girl, get up. To Tabitha, get up. He's saying the same thing again. It's just, it's just another. These, these disciples are, are reliving all of their ministry of Jesus. They're just applying those same things in other places. They're not recreating things. They're just doing what Jesus did. Literally. Which, as an aside, if that alarm ever goes out for me, because I'm up here on this platform and I fall out and I need CPR, I'm going to ask somebody to hold Andy and, know, and, and just know that, that if you come up here and throw CPR on me and I come back, I'm probably not going to be happy with you because I was in the arms of my Savior. I was with the Lord and you brought me back to this place. <laughs> I'll, I'll be okay after a little while, but right up front, I'm going to be a little upset. I just want you to know. Just, just let me know. Just let me know. No, I don't know. <laughs> Scripture, though, gives us a few details of this life of Tabitha. First, it tells us that the, the big difference between Tabitha and Jairus' daughter is that she was Christian. Jairus' daughter was not. Second, I think is related, is how the Scriptures give us her name. Dorcas sounds odd. Sounds like, man, I would never name my child with such a name. Wow. Especially today. But the reality of what her name means, her name means gazelle. Gazelle. And, and all throughout scripture, the word gazelle always referred to ideas of beauty and grace. Now, how a mom knew to name her child an image of beauty and grace, I don't know. I guess she just had a feeling, right? But throughout Scripture and, and throughout this woman's life, beauty and grace marked her life, just as it did the gazelle. We're told that she was always doing good. In other places, it says that she was full of good works. Here we have Tabitha, a woman deeply loved by her community, by her neighbors, because of the way she consistently served others pretty clear, but I want to make sure we don't miss it. And that is the beauty of generosity. See, when Peter went upstairs, who was he surrounded by? The widows, right? 
And in their world, a widow was someone who had no one to watch out for. She had no way of kind of earning her way. She was totally dependent on the goodwill of others, the, the charity of others. And they're begging him to bring her back to life. Look at what she's made. Please help. She didn't give old clothes to goodwill. This was a lady who made the clothes. She didn't have too much furniture, so she called up, you know, the, the, the secondhand store and said, hey, I got a donation for you. Can you come pick it up? No, she didn't. She wasn't generous like that. She was generous like she made the things and gave them to the people personally. She didn't give them gift cards to the Coles Bazaar. No, she didn't do that. She actually made it by hand. She stayed up. She invested herself in her charity, in her generosity. She gave of herself, not stuff. She was generous. And this kind of generosity is beautiful. We know it. Because it, 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 it demonstrates for us the love and the character of God. Being generous like that. When you give of yourself, it's, it's important. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. This is, what she, this was, this was her life. That she was giving of herself on behalf of others. This is, this is God's call for us. 1 John 3, 16 is God's call on our lives. If you're a Christian here today, this is God's call for you to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters as in this case. So let me ask you, how do you, how do you respond to that when you, when you hear that? Like, the, okay, how do, you, how do you, what voice do you hear in your head? Is it, oh, I'm pretty generous. Well, whew, man, I'm glad I'm generous too. Well, let me tell you a story. <clears throat> as many of you know, we were trying to build by this building behind the church here, and it didn't work out, so we've been talking about putting a parking lot in it behind the church. And Michelle and I were praying, and um, we decided to, to donate $50,000 to the park. It, it felt like the Lord had really come on to do that, right? A family is in need right now. The family's house in Canada caught on fire, and, and we're not living in our house, so we decided we would give them our house rent-free for a year. <clears throat> and then there was a family in our church whose kids were struggling in school, and uh, we arranged a scholarship debt to go to the Christian Academy for a year. And, I mean, yeah, this was a sacrifice, right? Because, I mean, you know what pastors make, and um, you're thinking, man, even if you've got money saved, that's like everything he's got. And you're, you'd be right if it were true. Um, but but then, then I were to tell you that a year ago, my family's farm. My dad's estate by themselves. And they sold the family farm. We got an inheritance. $100 million. Now I'm so generous. When you think about it, right? Because there for a minute you were thinking, is he for real? Is he telling the truth? Like, I don't know if this is made up, made up or what. It's all made up. It's, it's all made up. I'm not buying the parking lot. I'm not, it's all made up. But, but I just wanted you to think, like, for a second, you were thinking, like, wow, that's really generous. Generosity is beautiful, right? And you were, like, inspired. Some of you were like, I'm like, I'll help. And, and, but, then, but then when you think about it, like, okay, but he's got $100 million. That's, like, not even 1%. He's not, that's not generous. Right? It was, then for a second, it was beautiful. And then it wasn't. <laughs> my son is back there like, what in the world? <laughs> <laughs> but when I was old, when I was generous, you were all feeling warm and fuzzy towards me. <laughs> and now you're not so much. <laughs> Generosity is beautiful and beauty always gets special treatment. Beauty always gets assumed the best, right? Beauty always does. Generosity is always beautiful. Proverbs 31 describes it. Proverbs 31 is a great description of this beauty. Chapter, chapter 31, verse 18. 
she sees she's describing the ideal bride, right? Verse 18 describes, she sees that her trading is profitable, that her lamp does not go out at night. She stays up all night, all night. What's she doing? In her hands, she holds the distaff, I'm not sure what that is, and she grasps the spindle with her fingers. She's making fabric. She's sewing all night. She's Why? Smart. Why? Verse 20, she opens her arms to the poor and extends her, she extends her hands to the needy. She, she's making, she's sewing, she's making fabric. <laughs> Why? For her family, for sure. The, the, the chapter explains that. But also for those in need. She's giving herself away. She's, she's being charitable with her time. She's being generous with herself. And that is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be generous. Whether it's a church or an individual, whenever we see it, we're captivated by it. We really are. It makes our lives, it makes our church attractive to people outside of us. The more beautiful you are, the harder it is to call you arrogant. The more beautiful you are, the, the harder it is to say you're narrow-minded, to say you're a hypocrite. Because people give grace to beauty. We know that. I'm, what I'm telling you is that, that you can change the perception that people have of the church, of Jesus, even of yourself, by being generous. Because generosity is beautiful. You can do it one person at a time, one neighbor at a time, one coworker at a time, one kid at school at a time, one at a time. That's how Jesus lived. So let me ask you, how generous are you? Tabitha's life is a reminder for us that it's essential for us as, as disciples to live our lives as letting our light shine before men, right? That they may see our good works. Because there's an evangelistic goal to our life. We live our lives for the sake of others so that others may see and glorify God. That's the whole point. As Easter people, that's the, the entire point of our life, as Easter people. Which leads to the last point I'm going to make today, and then I'll let us out of here. And that we should live our lives as with a reflection of the resurrection. This is a touchy subject that I just mentioned a moment ago when I talked about good works. So I want to talk about that for a second. Two minutes. Quickly. Could spend a lot more talking about it. The resurrection is real, right? We celebrated last week. Our faith tells us so. Jesus has changed the direction of our lives. And not only that, but even the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us has changed the, the way we walk that way, right? Scripture also teaches us what we are to do with this salvation that we have. As Romans 12, 2 says, don't conform to any, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, first, be transformed with your mind, your mind, and then your heart will be changed. Allow the Spirit of God to change your mind, and then your heart, then, like, then you're lined up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which he planned in advance. Before you showed up, the good works were there for you. So yeah, we're supposed to do good works. Many in our world think that being good, doing good things is the way to win approval with God. That's how I can. God, God likes me because I do good stuff. That's not the way it works. Jesus is the reason God likes you. Jesus is the reason. We live our lives in response to that. It's the life that Tabitha lived in response to what Jesus had already done. It's the life that Peter was living. Titus, a book we don't read very much. Titus chapter 2, verse 7 says, In everything, this is Paul telling Titus, he's telling us, In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity and seriousness. You know what choosing to live for the benefit of others does to you? 
It doesn't save you, right? Because it, your salvation is already secure in Christ. But what it does do for you is it chips away at your pride. It chips away at selfishness. It chips away at, at all of those things, leading to humility, to gratefulness, and dare I say, it leads to joy. Yeah, generosity leads to joy. Not happiness, but real, lasting joy. It, it sanctifies us. That's the word we as Methodists use. It makes us holy. It actually makes us holy. If the church, when we begin to love others sacrificially, you know what it does? When, when, you, when you experience this together, it gets rid of the things that no one likes anyway. The things that we can't figure out how to get rid of ourselves, generosity will make those things go away. I mean, no one likes arrogance, narrow-mindedness, a bunch of Bible-thumping hypocrisy. Nobody wants any of that, right? Generosity will get rid of all those things. Just like paying the count gets rid of those things. Same way. Just it gets rid of them. It moves them out. They have no reason to want to be there anymore. The church that sacrificially loves thrives because those pride and arrogance die. So we should live a life that reflects the resurrection. Paul continues here real quick in 9 through 11. Well, where to go? Verse 9. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything to try to please them, not to talk back to them. So we're the slave, right? Christ is our master. And to not steal from them, but to show them that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive by how we live. For the grace of God that belong that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's Christ, that salvation is for all. That's the greater miracle in this story. I mean, yes, yeah, someone was healed after eight years. Yes, yeah, someone was brought was resuscitated back to life, but they would die again. So would the one who was finally able to walk after eight years. They're both going to die. But to be truly healed, spiritually healed, to be made whole with God, it means great when people find healing. And if you're here today needing that, then continue to pray for you. But the real miracle is having our lives transformed by Christ, being saved, going from death to eternal life. That this life that we have now would never end. We'll be in Christ forever. That's the desire. That's true healing. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your gift of life. We ask you, Lord, that right now you would meet us here. As we continue in worship to prepare for this holy meal, we ask you, Lord, bless us. We love you. Amen. As we know, Jesus came into the world to, to forgive sinners, and we are the very worst, right? As he, as he went to the cross to die on our behalf, that's been God's prom, plan and promise from the very beginning. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our forgiveness. We fail to love. We fail to be generous. We fail to represent you. God, we, we repent of that. Have mercy. Forgive us. We know that in you is found